It is my absolute delight to welcome Pumla Gobodo Madikizela um, to join us in, on the panel of presenters. And she's actually going to be talking to us, exploring the meaning of Ubuntu and actually looking at the politics of for forgiveness within that. She's done such amazing work. You can read her bio in the program that's available. But um, I think many, many of us um, know of her work in relation to forgiveness and the challenges and the rewards mm -hmm. and the opportunities. Pumla, Thank I hand you. over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Theo. Thank you um, very much, especially um, to Cliff who with his colleagues, Kali and others, have been uh, organizing this event for more than a year. It's a wonderful privilege for me to be associated with this conversation that spans uh, time, space, and a uh, real wonderful privilege to be here in Botswana. Uh, I come from that generation uh, of South Africans um, whose memory of Botswana is a wonderful memory of connection with the struggles of, uh, uh, for, for, for liberation of the people of South Africa. And right then in those years, in the 1960s, uh, especially 1970s and 80s, the generosity and Ubuntu that came from this country is something that we South Africans will never forget. I know that... Um, <laughs> I know that many uh, of your people in Botswana suffered as a result of our being here, of our uh, people being in South Africa. Uh, and and I, I just feel that just returning to this place, having come back in the 1980s to uh, ostensibly to music shows, mm -hmm. it's just this wonderful memory when I landed and uh, driving to to the to the university here, it just filled my heart with such warmth. So thank you very much that you thought of organizing the event at this place. I want to start where you with what you, the way you introduced me as uh, someone who's worked on Ubuntu and uh, on on themes of forgiveness. And to state at the outset that my work now is moving away from the word forgiveness as a word, because I find it to be a word that is misleading, doesn't really capture the essence of what you want to talk about when, when you're talking about Ubuntu. It's also a word that's become in my country a bit of a swear word. <coughs> the, the current generation, for a range of reasons, you know, things have not changed. Young people continue to experience the transgenerational poverty that their parents were, ex were exposed to, the, uh, 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 the lives, uh, lives of humiliation, of, uh, of lack, of absence, of loss. And so they find it difficult to connect with this notion of what it is to be human with Ubuntu. However, I think that it's very important for us to articulate this notion of Ubuntu as an African ethical orientation. There is a, a, a desire on our part to integrate the notion of Ubuntu with the themes uh, of philosoph philosophy, of ethics, as it is understood in the Western world. There is a desire to do that. And, and, and there's a reason for that because we want to put these experiences right in the center of these global debates about what it is to be human with these large philosophical debates. But I think that it's also important for us to articulate it as an African concept, to remember, to name it as an African concept, so that we don't madly, we, 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 it does not become colonized within the general kind of discourse of, you know, philosophical concept. It is truly an African concept. And I think we have to 
we have to we have to respect that to dignify that and i and i don't think that is necessarily about essentializing the concept i'm also of the view that ubuntu is very much a human experience nonetheless it's also in terms of its origins as a concept that originates within the african philosophical people don't think of african philosophy of african experiences as experiences that can birth large philosophical ideas there are these scholars of philosophy i mean you get scholars of african philosophy they are a handful they and they are sort of on the margins it's never about this is the philosophy of what life is about that's what we need to reclaim this concept and put it in the center so i want to begin with the way that the concept has been uh, 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 articulated within the broader scholarship is always put in contrast as a, as a concept that that is in contrast with the uh, 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 the cartesian notion of i think therefore i am and the opposite of that uh, 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 is supposed to be uh, 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 um, uh, you what is the what is the english thing uh, i am because we are now when you think about that there's nothing like that in african languages you there's no you can't translate that you know i, I am because we are you there's there's no expression like that in an african language you, i try to think about how does one translate this idea of i am because therefore we are i am because we are there's there isn't an expression in an african language that translates those words in that way therefore in my view what best captures this notion of ubuntu is actually back to the african languages themselves in my language Kosa, and in other languages we say umdu ngumdu ngabanye abantu mutu kibutu there you go so umdu ngumdu ngabanye abantu and if we translate that literally a human being or a person is a person because other people exist what that means is that my subjectivity depends on being witnessed by others i cannot be a human being a subject the, the very notion of being a human subject that notion of ungumdu ungumdu because you relate you are in relationship with others and that notion of being in relationship with others means you are being witnessed by others others are there to confirm as it were you know we had a, a musician in south africa she died uh, uh, brenda fast she says umuntu umuntu aka confirmer you know she talks about confirming a human being you know and, and and it's another story but I, i i like that notion of confirming you are confirming in other words you are a subject in the context of relational others because i see you now some of you who know zulu will know the expression of greeting saubona that does not come from nowhere there's a reason that that word is saubona i see you saubona i see you and and that 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 form of greeting even before we open our mouths to engage with each other i acknowledge your existence i recognize you I'm going to talk in a moment about a deeper aspect of recognition but i just wanted to speak for a moment about the this issue this idea of who we are as subjects in the world we are subject because we are witnessed by others that is a level of recognition there's another i have 50 minutes so i have to touch on 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 this uh, on this aspect which hopefully we will have a broader conversation about the second issue i want to to talk about in relation to ubuntu and being witness and recognizing the other has to do with who we are as embodied subjects you know the scholars who talked the philosophers who talked about thinking and therefore being it was almost like you know separating the human body from the human mind this kind of beingness being witnessed by others 
existing, feeling a sense of who I am in relation to another because you are, we are engaging, we are in relationship, also takes into account the embodied sense of being. Who are we as bodies, as black bodies, as white bodies, as Indian bodies, as all colors of bodies. You, we bring ourselves who we are as bodies, you know, somebody, a person you are is somebody. So you are an embodied being. And therefore, the body is very important in this idea of relating to the other. We are bringing each other's body, we are engaging through our body. And here is a deeper illustration of this notion of the body. In the work that I do, and part of the reason why I moved away from the word forgiveness, most many of the people who spoke about forgiving spoke about something happening at a deeper, at a level beyond simply the words I forgive. And so we were challenged to ask the question, what is it that happens when people forgive? And I'm not talking about forgiveness in the context of tragedy, of huge things, of major irreparable things that have happened to people. Someone killing some, your loved one, your father, your daughter, your son your wife, and then these people come together and, and, and the one who has lost says, I forgive you, it's totally counterintuitive. And scholars before we had these kinds of experiences in South Africa, for instance, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, scholars like Hannah Arendt said, it cannot happen, it's impossible, right? You forgive ordinary transgressions. Hannah Arendt says, says trust me, but these, these radically even acts, these acts that are radically evil, these evil that were committed, you know, by Eichmann, who was really like a trope for her, for her work, radically evil acts are not only unforgivable, you can't even apologize for them, and you can't apologize for them because there is no sense of, of, of imagining what it is that this person has done to destroy the world, to, to cause so much destruction. And she went further and to say, you can't even punish them. It's unpunishable because what do you say? Because when you punish through the law, at least, you punish because you say you've done this and this is a measure of what the transgression is. And so, so much, you know, means you can be punished for 20 years and so much for 30 years and so much for life. But these kinds of indescribable, unspeakable acts, they're unpunishable. This is why, in my view, the legal uh, uh, jurisprudence, prosecutorial kind of processes, do not help us to understand these processes. You know, if, if we're going to stay with the justice, even justice in the context of a human rights, it's very limited. It does not bring us closer to understanding these kinds of shifts that allow us to have these conversations. Why is it? What makes it possible for someone who has been wounded in this way to reach out with forgiveness? We need to go, we need to, uh, 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 to, to draw on different kinds of perspectives to understand. The law can help us because it's so limited. This other perspective that allows us to speak about, for instance, the body. What's the role of the body? And here is what many of the people I've interviewed who, have inter who are forgiven at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission tell me. We try in interviewing these people to understand what exactly, we are not satisfied with people saying, I, for, I decided to forgive this person because, you know, uh, they felt, they expressed remorse. We want to understand what is it that actually happens because we know that when we are wounded, we carry the wounds deep inside of ourselves. The trauma ruptures the sense of who we are. It redefines us. It undoes us. 
And so what is it about these processes that allow this kind of reconnection through ways of, re of forgiveness? We have to ask the question, what happens exactly to that story that the person carries within? And lo and behold, we were brought into connection with the body. Women talking about a concept, I will call it a concept because we need to name it something, a concept that is really known by many African people, Inimba. In fact, it's known by many people, but Inimba, Inimba, in, if you try to find a, an English word that closely describes what it is, we might call it the umbilical cord, but that's a very rough translation. Inimba means much more than that. Inimba is a kind of a feeling, you know, that parents, parents, but especially mothers talk about, you know, kwasika inimba. When mothers say, yasika inimba, they don't only re say those words in relation to their own children. My umbilical cord cuts, something cuts deep inside me, and you ask them, where exactly? And many women will say, it's behind the navel. And it's an interesting, in an interesting location within the body, that place of the navel. But let me say something a little bit more about inimba. So mothers will say, someone tells a story. They are not connected to them. They're not their children. It's a man, it's an older man, it's not a child. And someone reaches out with an embrace. And then they explain to you that kusike inimba. When a woman says kusike inimba, they mean something cut very deep inside my womb. Something moved inside my womb. In fact, they talk about a movement. And the interesting thing about this movement is that it's a movement that connects with this person. You think at least that the person standing in front of you is the person with whom this connection is established. But in conversations with some of these women, the link is not necessarily with the person who is asking forgiveness, who is the killer. The link is with the mother of this person. And this is what I want us to talk about today. I'm hoping at least you can elaborate on because it's something that I'm also uh, 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 trying to theorize about. So here in psychoanalysis, they simplify it, they say it's the presence of the third. So it, it's a term, you know, it's a working term. It's the third. The third enables the connection between the two. So it's an intersubjective relationship that is actually enabled by the existence of the third, as the psychoanalysts will say. But if we stay within the African context of relationship, of a, a relational kind of context, we will understand that this response to this man evokes this feeling and connection to the mother of this man. Why? Because I am like the mother. The mother has the child, has born this child. The mother has a vision for their child. The mother names this child something. You know, one uh, uh, um, a story that is on my mind right now, a mother names her son Tabelo a name that means umtandazo in my Kosa language and in English it means prayer. What was in the mother's mind when she named this child Tapelo, a prayer? She gives birth to this child, names him prayer, and then this child goes and kills. Not one person, but several people, works with the apartheid government, becomes a, a, a part of the hit squad to kill enemies, so-called enemies of the state. And now I am faced with this man who killed my child and he is in front of me laying himself bare, asking forgiveness. And what happens to me as a person forgiving, I see him, but before him, between me and him, I see the mother. And I ask the question, I wonder how does the mother feel about that? And that is the point of recognition. When we speak about these encounters, the notion of recognition of the other 
it's not simply a seeing the other as a human other in the face of the other in front of us. It's actually seeing and going beyond recognition to actually put yourselves in the shoes of the other and being like them and engaging in these kinds of questions. What is going on in the mind and the heart of this mother when she hears about the deeds that the son have done, has done? That is the point of recognition that I would like us to think about when you think about Ubuntu. Ubuntu, that's what Ubuntu is. You really put yourself, you are in, as Bishop Tutu speaks about, the inextricable interwovenness of who we are. That is what the Archbishop is talking about. It's an inextricable interwovenness. That standing before this man, seeing this man, my life is so interwoven with his mother that my feelings of pain and hurts are the mother's feelings of pain and hurt. I imagine the mother. And this is why imagination is such an important aspect of our conversations about these experiences. Imagination. To be able to imagine what's happening in the heart of the other person. How, what stirs the other person. What is the pain that they are going through. And the body being so central in that because now I am transported. My, my, the, the, the rupture and the rumbling and, and the turmoil within myself is not so much about this young man. It's about the mother who is experiencing the same turmoil, the same birth pains that I had when I had my own child. I experiencing the same birth pain that this woman had with this boy, with this young man who now becomes a killer. How does she, how does she look at that? How does she feel about that? <coughs> so the last part of my sharing with you, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, my presentation, I want to share with you some maybe two illustrative examples because it's very important for us. You know, human beings are not philosophical stances. You know, you can, you know, theorize, but when you actually witness what happens when people engage and you witness how these kinds of experiences unfold, it, 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 it brings home to you what it is that one is talking about. I served on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and even though at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission we were guided by this notion of reconciliation, that the dialogue of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a dialogue that brings people together. But even as we did that, even as we approached the work of the commission inspired by this, by this orientation, we never imagined that we would have actual examples of people forgiving after so much tragedy. We thought, you know, excuse me, reconciliation is a, it's a, it's a political, which was a political orientation, you know, and it was a language that actually allowed these kinds of conversations to take place. And I just want to say something very, uh, almost like a footnote before I, I, I share one or two examples. The truth and reconciliation, if, if we go back to a comment I made earlier in relation to uh, Hannah Arendt's work who says these acts are unpunishable, precisely because they are unpunishable a different kind of response was necessary because the courts, you know, these are, what do you say? You know, Nazi perpetrators were all sent to the gallows. They all, you know, went and they were, well, not all, the 22 of them, at least in Nuremberg, that first major trial, they were hanged. And from our reading of what happened then, none of them were given a chance to reflect on what they did. To so much so that 
a majority of them, they went to the gallows, still hailing Hitler. Before they were hanged, they would go, hail Hitler. So there was no engagement, no opportunity for reflection. Here, this process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission challenges perpetrators. It actually forces them to be accountable. It doesn't say, you are monsters, you know, you will be hanged. It challenges them to reclaim their sense of humanity and from that position to face the other, from the position of being responsible other. This is why it was possible for perpetrators, even the hardcore perpetrators, such as, for instance, the person I write about in my work, Eugene de Kock, was known as prime evil, who was relegated and thrown out and really quarantined in the world of quintessentially other. Never shall reclaim a sense of being human. And yet, this person and a few others, and not many of them to be sure, and we can talk about why later, but these people, because, precisely because, the way that the commission was structured, you speak the truth, you are granted amnesty. You speak the whole truth, you are granted. It's not, a, it's not a, 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 an automatic amnesty, you, you know, as in other countries. It's not a blanket amnesty, and it's not superficial. It's very weird, an investigative committee to investigate whether people actually spoke the truth. You are required to speak the truth. And here is a point, important point about that in relation to what we're talking about. It allowed perpetrators to feel a sense of humanity for themselves. Because when people destroy and kill and murder, they dehumanize the self. You, have to dis you can't see your own humanity. The humanity that binds you to another. Obabu wundu, that wutu, that connects you to the other person, it's cut off. It's non-existent. This is why you can kill, murder, torture. But here is a moment that says, look into yourself. This is an opportunity for you. You are going to be given amnesty. But by speaking the truth, there is a truth that is factual. This is what happened. This is what, who gave me orders and so on. And many perpetrators did that. You know, they recited the truth as they were required to say. However, because this is about truth telling, there was also a few of them who dared to actually dig deep into their conscience and to face the truth of their hearts. And that is why they were able then to acknowledge that what they did was evil. For those others, they continue, continue to say it was a war, you know, to justify it in a range of ways. I was obeying orders and so on. For these others, they know it's not just about obeying orders. I did it myself. I pulled the trigger. I killed that woman's daughter. And I remember her pain in the eyes, in her face. And that facing that truth, facing that aspect of the truth, allows them, therefore, to face the lie within themselves, the lie that silenced this conscience. And it reopens that moment of truth and allows them to feel a sense of remorse. Because what is remorse if it is not the ultimate human moment? It is the ultimate human moment where the perpetrator reconnects with the silenced humanity. And this happens because a Truth and Reconciliation Commission says, thou shalt not hide from thyself. A court of law says, we encourage you to hide. If you get the best lawyer, you can hide and they can make sure that the truth disappears. Here, and, and as a result, the person never is able to face that moment of truth within. These kinds of processes allows the transcendence that allows perpetrators to face the truth and opens up the space for the other person who is wounded to see the humanity in them. 
I'm not saying that the act itself is human, but the moment opens up the space for that dialogue between people who are human beings to say to them that you have hurt me, this is my pain. And the other one to say, I feel such shattered, shattering shame for what I've done, for the pain I have caused you. Here is another expression from my language. Intloni zikwenza umdu. Shame makes you human. When people commit these acts and they continue to deny and to justify, they are hiding away from their shame. But when they face their shame, they are now reconnecting with what it is to be human. As I say in my language, can you imagine that? Shame makes you human. If you can have shame for what you've done, then you are reclaiming your right to become a human being again. And so these people, these moments of encounter between victims and perpetrators, it's a reconnection. These are human moments that are being created. So here is one story. I think I'll give one because of time. I can give two. So thank you. <laughs> so one is uh, the first one that I want to, to share with you illustrates, again, the transgenerational impact of a process such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Because we had a truth, uh, the, uh, uh, I also want to mention that there are lots of other challenges and problems of the Truth Commission, one of which is that it didn't address the very structural issues that brought about apartheid and the suffering of apartheid. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was not doing that. People say they faulted for that, but I think it's a wrong faulting of the Truth Commission. The Truth Commission was meant as a different process to open the path for that other structural transformation to happen. Our government today has not put out their efforts to do that is what is important to transform our society. They've become very selfish, they've become thinking about themselves, corruption is huge, that's who should be faulted. Truth and Reconciliation Commission opened a different path. As a result, young children who, children who were young at the time of the crimes by apartheid are now drawing from the language of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because we created the, the, the language the language enabled us to put this stuff on the table to say, now we know it's all here. We know how to talk about it. It creates language. Because how do you talk about someone who's killed my loved one and burn them on a stake, you know, and throw their ashes in the river to hide evidence? How do you talk about that? The commission allowed us to talk about that. It doesn't mean that we are justifying it. It doesn't mean that by finding a way of understanding it, you are saying that it can be explained. It still may not, we cannot even still not be able to explain it, but it does open a path for us to reconnect with who we are as human beings living together in a country. So children, one daughter, two daughters, who were a few months old when their parents were killed, by Eugene de Kock, who in South Africa was known as prime evil. Eugene de Kock came and his men came in and out of Botswana, across the borders to murder enemies of the state, so-called enemies of the state. His, his whole establishment was supported by the apartheid government. They were given funds, state payers, uh, uh, taxpayers monies to support their operations of death squads. They came to this country and killed many people of the liberation forces. One of those people uh, who was killed was the mother of a woman called Marcia Koza. Marcia Koza was in her late 20s, about three years ago, when she went to visit Eugene de Kock. Her mother, I think actually her mother may have even been killed in Botswana, either here, I think it was in Botswana. Her mother, uh, uh, she was five months old. Uh, a few months old when her mother was killed by Eugene de Kock's men because he was heading up the COVID operations unit of the apartheid government. He had an official position. He was not a rogue murderer. He, was, he had a position. He was the head of COVID operations under the apartheid government. 
and now, years later, she's living with this memory of the mother who died in ways that she still is unable to understand. No one has explained to her why her mother was targeted. She decides in her late 20s, she's going to visit Eugene de Kock in prison and confront him and ask him, why did the mother die? Why was the mother killed? She gets, she's, this is the wonderful thing about the, commi the commission, the agency that victims reclaim a sense of agency. You know, I can do this. I can act. This is an action that I myself am determining. It's long after the Truth Commission. She goes to prison. She seeks out to meet this man. And in that encounter, the first thing she notices is Eugene de Kock is stepping out of, by the way, Eugene de Kock was granted amnesty for some of the crimes and not granted amnesty for crimes, for some one crime for which he was serving a life sentence because there was some inconsistency and the commission felt that he, he could not be granted amnesty for that particular crime. So he's stepping out of the cells and she's waiting in the waiting area. And, sh and the moment Eugene de Kock sets his eyes on her, sitting in the distance, he trips and almost falls. And the first thing he says to her as he's greeting her, he says, you look so much like your mother. And for her, that is an important statement of recognition. He remembers that you look so much like your mother. He has not, they have not talked yet. They have not engaged. You look so much like your mother. So he remembers the mother's face. He may have killed her, but that face. And so much so that he almost trips. And I'm thinking as she's telling the story, it's like he's seeing a ghost of the mother. And indeed, Eugene de Kock is one of the perpetrators who lives with these ghosts. I'll, if I have time, I'll say more about that maybe during Q&A which is the danger, again, of remorse, the danger of facing these truths, what it does to the perpetrator who's done these terrible things. So they engage in conversation. She's asking, she's got a lot of questions, you know, what was my mother wearing? What did she say? What did she look like? She's asking all questions that you and I might think they're inconsequential. She wants to know every little detail about because he is, the, he is the last person to have seen the mother. You see how much power he has in her memory. He's the last person to have seen the mother. He may have caused the death, but in terms of the kinds of things that she wants to know about, he is the answer to all those unanswered questions, besides all the reasons why she was killed. Now, here is a very poignant moment when we had her at my university, we asked her to come and share with us her meeting with Eugene de Kock and in a room of this kind, I asked her, what was the most memorable moment for her in this conversation with Eugene de Kock? She describes the last few minutes towards the end because she only had an hour. She just looked at the time and she saw it's almost time up and I still have so many questions and she wanted now to rush all the questions. She says, As the more I was asking and Cook was answering the questions and she says, the more I was asking the questions, the more anxious I got about time, I realized I'm, I was getting, coming closer and closer to him. And at some point, our knees were touching because you can imagine these small tables in prison, they're sitting across the table. Our knees were touching. And then she says, I became aware that I was so close to him because I was asking questions. I became so close that I felt as if we were breathing the same air. Our noses were so close to each other that we were breathing the same air. And I thought to myself, what a powerful metaphor, breathing the same air. You know, that, that's the place that in terms of this relatedness, one to the other, an embodied sense of presence of each other, this inextricable connection that Archbishop Tutu talks about, is that kind of so connected are we that we are 
connected and breathing, you know, in the air that you breathe out is, br you know, the other person breathes in. So it's almost like something that passes through our veins is connecting us. If you can e elaborate on the metaphor. And just to end with one other story of the mothers who are the ones who introduced me to this notion of a nimba. One woman who was, she passed away now, her son was killed, was uh, uh, shot, dead uh, in the face, she couldn't recognize her son. She says when she was going through Mog after Mog looking for the body of her son, she says, I could only recognize my son with his feet. He was totally unrecognizable. And this is a woman who was going every day to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to listen to the testimonies of white police officers of the apartheid government, denying, making excuses, justifying what they did. And she says, I was going to this knowing that these people are not going to speak the truth, but I wanted them to see me that they did not destroy me. She had special, you know, things. She made a hat. Someone, you know, knitted a hat. She made she she made beadwork. She made a bead neck beaded necklace. She said, I wanted to look good, so that they could see that they did not destroy me, which is what they wanted to do. I wanted to look the way that I do. I wanted to pay attention to how I looked, so that they can see me. I want them to recognize that. I am a proud human being. They may have treated my son inhumanely and killed him like the dog, which they did. In fact, they would kill them and then they would tie them with ropes, pretending to the outside world that these men were covered with bombs and so they're unsafe even in death. It's a pretext, a narrative that they were trying to, uh, to generate uh, in, in, in the public, to the public. This woman then encounters a black man. This man was called Tabelo, his name meaning prayer, who was a black person working with the white police as the, uh, um, the informer, the police informer. They were trained to kill. They were part of a murder squad. And this woman talks about these mothers, and I'll talk about this particular one who was the first one to talk about Inimba to me. She says, when this man wanted to speak to us, we were on the commission, he wanted to meet with the mothers. We had to prepare the mothers for about a week for this meeting with this young man because we did not know what would uh, you know, transpire. We met with him, of course, to, establ to make sure that his intentions were pure, for want of a better term. And we were satisfied that he wanted to connect with the mothers because he was burdened. And it was not only about wanting to unburden themselves. He wanted to show how much shame, how much pain he felt for what he had done. So we organized the meeting. And for the mothers, for this particular woman, she says, just that he asked to meet with us. For me, it was enough to already begin to forgive him. Because by virtue of asking to see us, it meant that he recognized our pain. I still had to hear him. I still had to hear what he says, of course, because I couldn't just forgive him, but I was already in a state of forgiveness. And she is the one who talked about how this man's rem sense of remorse. And, and she, she speaks about how he laid himself bare. He made himself naked. Wazombula, you know, my, the, the Kosa language, African language are so dramatic. Wazombula, which means you shed off. You know, wazombula, wazombula, you shed off, you, you bring yourself in your nakedness. This is what this man did. And for her, this was a sign of the essence of remorse. And she says, remorse can't be evil. Remorse can't be evil. That's what you are as a human being. You can't bear. He bared himself. It's not just bearing the soul, it's bearing the body. And so what happens is that it then evokes <coughs> the nakedness, the original form of a child in her womb. 
it evokes that nakedness. It's interesting, the womb. I mean, when you think about it, again, one of the women, when I asked, where exactly is it? And she says it's behind the navel. When you think about it, the navel is a point of cut, right? You cut off when a human being is birthed, you cut off the umbilical cord. And the navel is a mark of that cut off. And so it makes sense that the reconnection has to happen at that point as well, right? That when these women feel inimba behind the navel, it's a dramatic way of reconnecting with that moment of nakedness, which is to say the moment of utter and absolute truth. And so this is why when we ask the question, how is it possible? Because people still ask, you know, Hannah Arendt would probably say, you know, and, and some scholars, uh, in fact, say, oh, this is a reaction formation, it's, it's a defense, it's not, they don't understand, you can't forgive, it's not possible. And this is why I think the word is misleading. We need to get to the essence of what is it that actually happens in order to appreciate the sheer possibility of the impossible. Then when we speak about the impossibility, this is why it's possible. It's all of these kind of things that layers and layers that you can't explain it by saying, you know, it's a change of heart. You know, these people train people to forgive 12 steps from step one to step 12. You arrive at step, step, step 12, you're forgiven. It, it doesn't get us to understand the complexity. And that is the African notion, the, the, this idea of even unraveling and trying to, to, to peel the layers, to explore and to explore deeper. We do through the African language, which allows this to happen. You, you ask the question when this young man says, Bazaliba, my parents forgive me. If I say it in English, you know, it's like any old person can say, I forget, how dare you say you asked me to forgive? How dare you call me as my son's killer, my parent? But in my language, when you say, Bazalibam, Dikela Ukolo, it touches something in the other person, the parent, the person who is standing as a representative of the parent right there. It's almost like they represent the whole community. And those words, the words, the language itself, the cultural language, the cultural meanings bring us closer and closer to this elaboration of what it means, what this notion, this concept of Ubuntu means. Thank you. 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 Thank you very much. Ukumla, that was just <laughs> amazing. I didn't want you to stop talking, but I know that we also want to open up a little bit to um, people to have your questions and your comments and, and your input. Um, so I'm actually just going to open it up to the panel here. I'm going to ask you to try and be concise so that we also have an opportunity to open it up to the floor. Um, it's really difficult to even think of what to <laughs> say in the face of all of that. Mandasa, please. Thank you, my sister, for a job well done. Thank you. It calls for courage to do what you did. And it again calls for courage to share these sad stories with us. Mm 